Good afternoon. I'm Al. I hope everyone's having a good time. Uh, today on the agenda, we are going to respond to a YouTube video that has over 23,000 views by a, um, a priest in the Anglican tradition, Father Steve Macius. Macius. It's an interesting name. <laughs> I, unfortunately, I can't pronounce it that well. Either way, uh, so we are going to be responding to a popular video. It's got 23,000 views. The name of the video is uh, The English Church Before It Was Roman, How Orthodox Anglicanism is an Ancient and Patristic Faith by Father Steve Macius. Uh, if you want to go, I've linked it down below to see it. I'm going to be showing it. We're going to go through it. Uh, uh, if you want, you can go to his YouTube channel, which is just Steve Macius, Steve spelt the normal way, M-A-C-I-A-S. So we will be reviewing and responding to this video by my father, Steve. But first, before we do that, I have an announcement to make. Remember a few videos ago, I did a response to one Rabbi Mike Harvey, and I told everyone to email his, his publisher to get his book deal canceled. I have just learned a few days ago that his book deal indeed has been canceled. So Fortress Press will no longer be publishing this. So it's a success. It's a success. And apparently he no, no longer wants to be called r rabbi. So, I mean, if, if a person spews hate like that, I'm glad that they're not publishing their book with a Christian company since, since he viciously hates all Christians. I know the Bible says to love your neighbor, but, um, in the in the, the Torah, but he's he's ignoring that Torah command for some reason. So yeah, the point is we got it canceled, and I think I was the first one to um um the the first one to, to openly call for that. I, I could be wrong, but I don't want to take credit because um it it has nothing to do with me. It was a team effort, and God bless you guys who sent an email to Fortress Press or contacted them on social media. So you did your part. Thank you and God bless. All right. Let's get to Father Steve's video, The English Church Before It Was R Roman. It's about 35 minutes. I'm not going to be uh, playing all of it. I'm just going to be playing, um, well, I I'm going to play all of it, but there's not going to be a lot of commentary on the first half of it because he just talks about like historical methodology, methodology and things like that. But as soon as we get to second half, he gets to historical events. I'm gonna, I'm going to uh, be talking about that. All right, let's go. Rector here at St. Paul's, and today is the feast of St. George. St. George is the patron saint of England, and it is appropriate that here on his feast day we talk about the English church. Specifically, this lecture will be entitled, The English Church Before It Was Roman. And we're going to Now, I just want to say, I, I find this, this problematic, because what does it mean to be Roman? Well, Roman Catholic, right? Under Roman authority. Well, he probably believes that the Christians in Rome in the second century weren't Roman Catholic, even though they were technically Roman by under Roman authority. It's, I just don't think it's a helpful term. It's kind of a very vague term. And it, it if it's vague, it's hard to pin down and re respond to. And he's going to be giving some arguments l later on that go a bit more in depth. And uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. I'm going to talk about that idea of the Anglican Church, its kind of historical place. And what existed as far as an Anglican church before Henry VIII or even before? There was, well, I, I don't believe there's an Anglican church before Henry VIII. Um, it's true that there were Christians in England. That is certainly true. Um, but they were not part of the modern Anglican church. They were, uh, well, I, I mean, I'd say Catholic, but... Um, here, let's keep listening. For the Roman Catholic Church. But to get there, uh, we're going to go through a, a kind of lecture on understanding church history and the goals of the Reformation. 
we're going to talk a little bit about the Celtic Christianity of the first few centuries and how that came into conflict and eventually resolution with the Roman traditions. He, br- he talks a lot about Celtic Christianity, but the thing is, we don't know a lot about it, and it's mainly from l- later sources. We know it existed, but he, but like, I think this is kind of a Trojan horse because he talks about it quite a bit, but, but it does not fit into his conclusion. He's not going to try to argue that Henry VIII was restoring the early Celtic church. No, <laughs> but um, let's, let's let him keep going. But before that, we should note that how appropriate it is to discuss this on the Feast of St. George. Now, our parish here had a committee established to create a festival for the Feast of St. George. We were going to have a festival called the Best of the Brits Festival, where we recognized all of the best in British culture. You know, the, the high reverence for the Queen, tea time, uh, our British uh, Ancestry as far as figureheads, our love of British television throughout the BBC, whether it's Doctor Who or, or, or Father Brown, uh, our love for British literature, whether it's the Understood. Chronicles of Narnia or the Lord of the Rings or, or Peter Whimsey or all of these things that we associate with English culture. And we wanted to bring those to the attention of the people here in our community because when people drive by St. Paul's Anglican Church and they see that strange word, they don't make the connection that Anglican is the same thing as the English church. In fact, to my great consternation, most people don't recognize that the history of America's religious foundations owes a great deal to its Anglican foundations. A great number of our... And Canada as well. I'm from Canada. Like, uh, I, I think most of the Christians in Canada are Anglican. You know, there's French Canada. But if you go, if you go outside of French Canada, there's, I think there's, in, in, in my city, there are more Anglican churches than, than Catholic ones. I'm an English speaking Canada. So, um, yeah, you know, it's certainly a, as, uh, British colonialism expanded, you know, they carried their faith with them, you know. Our American presidents were a part of the Episcopal Church or the American expression of Anglicanism since 1789. And our greatest presidents, men like George Washington, were baptized, confirmed, married, communed in the Church of England or in the Anglican tradition. But part of the problem is that when somebody comes into an Anglican church, once they figure out it's not an angel Lican church, <laughs> they look around the building and they see an altar, they see a man in a collar, they see the candles and all of the ornamentation, and they think, are you guys Roman Catholic? And you see, the problem in our culture today is that our view of church history is either dominated by one of two false dichotomous views. On one side, most American Christians of the Protestant variety hold to a view of church history called Restorationism. Now, this can be found whether you're a Presbyterian or Baptist. There's a degree of Restorationism in a lot of these views. And a very simple way to describe Restorationism is this way, is to say that Christ established his church. He sent the apostles out to create local congregations, whether it was in Corinth or Ephesus. And then, in the terrible times of the 4th century, Emperor Constantine came Uh and took control Uh of the church and added in all of these Roman superstitions like bishops and sacraments. And they completely polluted the faith to the extent that the true believers were forced underground to be a remnant. And in for a millennium or even 1500 years, these churches existed as a remnant until the Reformation or until... The cavalry are coming to the rescue. If this man is representative of Anglicanism, I can see why so people are leaving it. Well, I mean, we're, we're going to respond. Uh, uh, so I, I'm curious, John, have you seen this guy's video that we're going to go through here? Uh, yeah, no, he's. Uh, it, it, this is a popular video online, 23,000 views. So we'll. Uh, what's up, McVine? Hi, Bully, Kyle. 
uh, till their local congregation was formed and the truth was finally restored by their private interpretation. Maybe you've heard of some type of view of history like that. And there's a great deal yeah. of evidence to suggest that most Christians think this way. And believe it or not, although this is super false, unfortunately, it's the hardest to, uh, <laughs> to de debunk because those people are just so grounded in their um, false beliefs. And th they've been taught, like, there's a girl I know, she's a year younger than me. Uh, she's been, been evangelical her whole life. She believes in that. We've had countless debates. I have v very gently shredded her every time, but no, uh, she, she can't be Catholic for the life of her. I have tried. I have tried. Um, but, uh, no, she thinks if she will become Catholic, she will betray Jesus Christ and, um, yeah. All right, let's go. For example, can you name a Christian saint from the 8th century? How about the 11th century? When We're someone goes seven. to describe Yay. the Christians of the period between Constantine and the Reformation, what religion do you think the people in England are? Or the people of the Germanic lands? Or the people of Italy? Do you default and think, well, they must be Roman Catholic? You see, you have now embraced a restorationist view of church history. And the great problem with this is it unchurches or takes Christ away from the... Well, no, the, the problem with this is it's, it's blatantly false. Like that stuff is, is true, what, uh, what Father Steve is saying, but th th this is just blatantly false, that's why. And there's no evidence to support it, and they're just so... Genuine expressions of those local grounded. churches. Specifically, as we're going to talk today about the English church, we're well, going to say that the English church has had an independent expression of faithful Christianity since the first century. What does he mean by independent? What does he mean by independent? Yes, it's true. There have been Christians in England since the earliest days. No one's going to dispute that. But he's going to try to say they were kind of like these proto-Anglicans. Okay, all right. I'm, I'm going to say his thesis. He's got like the early church was like proto-Anglican. Then the Romanists took over in year 800 or whatnot sometime between then and henry the eighth the romanists took over the roman church which is bad 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 and then king henry the eighth frees them that's essentially his thesis he puts it a bit smoother and he'll add some details but we're going to go and we're going to quote sources that is going to show that uh, our good friend father steve is incorrect and that English Christianity has existed since the very beginning of the gospel being promulgated throughout it the has. four corners of the world. And that that expression has been faithfully passed down generation after generation, bishop after bishop. Well, I don't think he believes that because eventually it became apostate. Now, at what point it became apostate? It depends who you ask. He's going to, he kind of changes the goalposts because he kind of blames it on Pope Gregory the Great. But then he goes to a thousand years. He, he talks about the undivided church. So yeah, he, he, he kind of shifts his arguments, kind of hard to pin him down. And has held itself against the gates of hell and has held on to the keys of the kingdom and held on to the promises of our Lord himself who says the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. Amen. The other you know, great error in reading church history is an idea called triumphalism and this can be often seen in Roman Catholicism. Oh. It can even be seen in Greek Orthodoxy and oh. perhaps to some degree in the English church as well. But is the idea that the Roman Catholic Church at some point received the authority to be the titular or even real head of the church on earth. Now the Roman Catholic apologist will say that Jesus Christ gave the keys of the kingdom to St. Peter. Amen. And therefore, the heir of salvation is all of those churches who have followed into communion under St. Peter. The triumphalism of the Roman Catholic Church. See, I don't like the word triumphalism. And I'll tell you why. Because it's not really a, 
a historical word in debates. Like, like for example, like historical words, like common words, like if we're debating Orthodox Christians, it's papal primacy versus papal supremacy. And everyone knows what those means. One is kind of like a, you know, like first among equals, final court of appeal type, you know, papal primacy. Then there's papal supremacy, the universal jurisdiction and the infallibility of the Pope. Um, so, and instead of this triumphalism, what does that even mean? Like a Catholic view of history is the triumphalist view of history. I don't know. It, it just seems like an unnecessary word. Church goes as far to say as if you reject communion with the See of Peter, with Rome, then you might not even be truly Christian. And so See, I, I think is both Protestants and to a certain extent Orthodox take a look at us and think all that matters is the Pope. It's like, well, to be a Catholic, you got to submit to Rome. Well, Yes, that is one of the doctrines, but it's like you have to believe all the doctrines, which is, and that includes ecclesiology, having the right ecclesiology. Um, but you also have to have the right view of Christology, Mariology, sacraments, purgatory, all of it. So the triumphalism of the Roman Catholic oh, Church shows that they claim from the very beginning from the first century, this preeminence or dominance from the see or the diocese of Rome and through their patriarch or, as we might have it Latinized, their father, their pope in Rome, preeminence among all the other bishops of the world. And that everybody, in order to be rightfully considered a Christian, has to follow the Roman way of thinking, worshipping, and... No, not the Roman way of w w worshiping. You have to believe in all the doctrines. For example, my mom is not a Roman Catholic, but she is just as Catholic as I am. She's in an Eastern Rite. There are several Eastern Rites. There are, and back then, there were several expressions of the faith. Now, unfortunately, there has been schisms and breakoffs since then. But there, you, you don't have to do the Mass exactly how they do it in Rome. You don't have to pray exactly how they do in Rome. <sighs> You can, but it's not r required. In different parts of the world, people have their own ways of worship, but the the doctrine has to be identical. Identical. It's not like, well, in this church, they believed in a r r real presence of the Eucharist. In this one, they believe it's a symbol, and they're both in communion. Can't have that. Can't have that. Faith is universal. And acting. Now the great problem with this type of triumphalism is that it's just historically incongruent. The second largest communion, the... We'll see who's incongruent. Orthodox churches uh, claim that for the first thousand years, there was no such thing as Roman triumphalism. There was well, they, like, like, like as you said, they claim their own triumphalism. So... It's one triumphalism or another. Again, this is a bad word. I don't think we should use this word triumphalism because it's not a, a technical word. There was no idea that the Pope was the supreme head of the church or that the other patriarchs, whether it be Constantinople or Antioch or even Jerusalem, were subordinated in any way to the Bishop of Rome. There might have been an honorific notion where they recognized that they were the descendants of Peter, but the same could be said of Antioch. Yeah, it's true that uh, the, the sees of Antioch and also Alexandria have been affiliated with Peter, and they noticed that in the early church, but they, they also knows, noticed that in the Catholic Church post-schism. Uh, if you, you go to uh, my appearance on Swan Sona's channel, I quote, Pope Innocent III talking about the three Petrine Seas. And no one's going to believe for a second that Pope Innocent III um, had viewed an equality amongst the three seas, or they're all Petrine in the same way. No, 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 no. Peter was affiliated with them, but Petrine with a capital P belongs in Rome and only Rome. So here in the Roman idea of triumphalism, is again this maligned view of church history, but common to both of these uh, really destructive approaches is this assumption that for the great majority of church histories, the default or the generic position of Christians is Roman Catholic. Now, they just can't. 
again, I don't know why he's throwing R- R- Roman. If you're in the Roman right, yes, but not all. Not every Catholic's a Roman Catholic. My, again, my mom is a Greek Catholic. Can't simply be true, because the idea of Roman-based Christianity didn't exist until after the idea of Pope Gregory the Great. The idea. Roman-based Christianity didn't exist until after Pope Gregory the Great. Well, um, <laughs> well, then what were the Christians in Rome? Did they not have R- R- Roman-based Christianity? I mean, he's being like he—he he does not explain w- w- what he means. Idea of the church coming under the papal authority or the church being a mission under Rome conflicts with the independent and self governing uh, nature of the national churches as they existed in their state before Rome began making these commands. National churches, no, that, that, that kind of, incl- uh, that, that's kind of in, uh, assuming that churches operated. Um, along ethnic boundaries and that's not true like the the borders we have today are modern borders and you had like the the first place to get christianity because it started there was the roman empire it starts in palestine in the holy land but it goes to to greece to turkey to of course i'm using the, the modern words to modern italy to north africa and like yeah they had their tribal allegiances but they had their faith allegiances as well and I think he's trying to introduce a whole bunch of n- nationalism because that's kind of where, like, because he's trying to, like, sell a national church. And for the for longest time, Christianity was not, like, a national thing. Um, Leo, who is head of all the churches, we, we have in our hands... or. I'm curious, is that a quote from Socrates of Constantinople? I think head of all the churches of the world. All right, let me continue. And so the context of our church history and understanding the English church before it was Roman is... And uh, of course, uh, John Colarafi brings up Pope Leo the Great, but there's examples that go further back than that all the way essentially back to the beginning i can't go through them all here i went through a bunch of them on swan's sonus channel if you take a look on this channel i have a two and a half hour response to a a video by dr gavin ortland um go check that out he tries to bring up saint cyprian and all the the classic arguments not to to toot my own horn but I dealt with those arguments with John Fisher 2.0. He was there too. Shout out to you, John, if you're watching. Really to reject both of these views right out of hand. To say we are not a restorationist church. The church came through Jesus Christ and has been passed faithfully on from generation to generation. Well, he, again, I don't think he believes that because he believes the church in England got snuffed out by the Roman triumphalism quote unquote. So, I mean, it got stopped for 500 years, 700 years, depending, uh, depending how long you want to say it. He's not very clear when he defines this. Uh, He, he brought up Pope Gregory the Great, but so that's about the year 600, but he's going to talk about eventually the undivided church of a thousand AD. Without so a period of them. lapse. There is never a time when the gospel has ever been extinguished. Now, That's the church true. has been a mixture of, of truth and error throughout all of the years. Even down when St. Paul was pastoring the church in yeah. Corinth, there was a mixture of truth and error. But there is in never Galatians. a time when somebody is able to overthrow the reign of Christ in his church in human history. So rejecting restorationism because really the greatest restoration... And I think that's hard to believe if you hold true to sola fide. Now, I don't know if if, uh, our friend Father Steve here believes in sola fide, but um, yeah, if you believe that's a gospel and if you add a single work, believe that you, you need plus works or plus baptism or plus something, 
Um, th- th- no, then uh, for, let's face it, for 1,500 years, that was not preached. Creationist movements in our day and age are the cultic movements. Men like the Jehovah Witnesses, Jehovah's Witnesses, who believe that their proper translation gives them the authority to have their own church. Or the Mormons, where Joseph Smith believes that all of the truth was found in his Book of Mormon, and all of the other churches, whether they Protestant or Catholic, were an abomination. That's really the root of all restoration ideas, that there is some new church that has recovered what was once lost. That's not how Christ established his church. And in fact, as well-meaning and pious as some of those sentiments are, they actually work to undo the foundations of Christianity. Many folks who really embrace a restorationist view of history will say, I just believe in Jesus, or I'm just Christian, or no creed but Christ, or just me and my Bible. That's it. What they're neglecting... Oh, by the way, uh, in the chat, if you're a Catholic, put a one. If you're Protestant, put a two. If you're Orthodox, three. Is that kind of restorationist view of history actually undermines the authority of Jesus. It takes away the promise that Jesus is with his church even to the end of the age. It undermines the value of the scripture to guide the church throughout all of the years. And it calls into question the authority of Christ on earth to rule his church the authority of the church to exert discipline, and it even calls into question the authority of scriptures. If one person in their restorationist view can have one completely and opposite view. That's a, that's a good question, Hallie. Where's Barely Protestant? I'm not sure. Uh, um, I've, I posted this on Twitter. Hopefully he sees it. I, I b- believe he knows Father Steve personally. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm sure he'll show up or watch this eventually. Shout out to Father James. ...of the scriptures. Take the Mormons or the Jehovah Witnesses that are completely against the creeds of our church. Then what value does the Bible have if it's not read in this historic orthodoxy? So, restorationism is a very dangerous and pernicious view. So, it rejected. But triumphalism is also equally dangerous, equally dangerous in that it reduces the church to this mere organic or human institution, and that somehow the tactile connection to one bishop or one lineage somehow provides for its validity. Not only is that a wrong way of thinking about orthodoxy, it's historically inaccurate. The tactile connection to Rome has not been good enough to keep Rome from air over the last 20 centuries. Even what today, era? the man who sits there as the Bishop of Rome uh, contradicts many of the scriptural values that we hold near and dear to our faith. Uh, the age of the earth, the idea of penance, the, what, what the strangeness the of See, the not. triumphalism of Rome is the fragmentation of the Roman communion as it stands today. It's divided. Even as though they criticize... We're not divided. We are united in creed. We are united in creed. Uh, Yeah, opinions, no. But like I think what Trent Horn said when he was on Father James' channel um, is is true. You know, creed is identical. Yeah. Sure, some individual Catholics might not believe in the deity of Christ. When they meet Christ after they die, they're going to be in trouble. But no, our creed is one. Besides the Protestants for being divided, there are inside the Roman Catholic... Exactly. Protestants are very divided. Like, if, if you take a look at Father Steve, he's in a Roman cassock with an altar behind him. How many Protestant churches look like that? Some do. Many don't. Walk Like, we go into a Baptist church or just a Calvinist church even. There's no altar in a Calvinist church. Church, great fishers of division. Those who believe that Pope Francis is not a true pope. But this is not... You, you know, it, it, it's amazing because of the internet, these people have a voice. When I go and talk with my fellow Catholics, and I know hundreds of Catholics, no one debates that because we know that Francis is the pope.
By the way, if you don't believe that, you're not a Catholic. Not new to us, because throughout the last 1,000 years, the Roman Catholic claims of being the triumphal church have been challenged by its right. own incompetence and self-contradiction. It's having like, multiple popes or popes. With there has never been multiple popes in the entire history of the church. There's been a pope and anti-popes challenging them, but there's not been multiple popes. With children or... Yeah, popes with children. Yeah, there's been evil popes. Popes. Do you want us to talk about... Who live false and ungodly lives. Do you want us to talk about the lives of Henry VIII and Thomas Cranmer? Does that prove Anglicanism false? No, it doesn't. Just like popes li living or other bishops living sinful lives, that doesn't prove the Catholic Church wrong. And so instead of embracing either of you, restorationism or triumphalism, we should look at a historic view of the church, historic, recognizing yes. that it's guided by Jesus Christ, lives inside the life of the tradition of the church, and is guided by the unfailing mark of the Holy Scripture. And this was really the mark of the Protestant Reformation. Rather than creating a new church, the reformers, particularly men like Thomas Cranmer, wanted to return the church to what it was in England before it was Roman. Again, Roman, what does that even mean? Like, it, it's so vague. Um... He he does a specific. He's pointed out Pope Gregory the Great, who, who's making grandiose claims, but he's going to try to shift that four hundred years to the one thousand mark. And in fact, men on. like Lancelot Andrews decided that they were pushing for reform, not of a new Anglican Church, but a Church of the undivided councils of the first ten centuries of the Church. Well, I mean, if he's pushing for a, a church of the first 10 centuries, how come? Um, but, ha okay, the, the first 10 centuries, like the first thing that uh, the Anglicans did when they broke from the, the, the Roman church was uh, dissolve all the monasteries. And the church of the first thousand years uh, v highly valued the monastic tradition. The Catholic Church today has monks and nuns. I know there's a couple Anglican m movements uh, today that are kind of trying to bring that back, and uh, I don't r really think it's worked to a large extent. But the, the thing is, traditional Anglicanism has been always anti-monastic. They The first thing they did was dissolve hundreds of monasteries. Oh, John, uh, yeah, no, that's true. We are going to quote, a bit later, we're going to quote our good friend, v Venerable Bede, and we're also going to quote an, another English Christian from that time. So, uh, oh, don't worry, plenty of that coming on. All right. Recognizing that there is a true ecumenical nature to Christianity. So as we look back to the church or the English church before it was Roman, we have to take a look at how Christianity itself got to the British Isles, how Christianity got to the English people. And there's a quite uh, a significant legend that Joseph of Arimathea, you know, correct. the one who paid for Jesus' burial, took the news of Christ's resurrection and used the Roman conveyances, the roads and the passages to get to Roman Britain. You see, at the first century, the imperial Romans, the same apparatus that Pontius Pilate belonged to, had created roads all throughout Europe and even established a beachhead there in Britain, there in what we call the Celtic lands. And so Joseph of Arimathea takes the gospel to England and begins establishing these Christian churches. Now it's important to know that throughout these 2,000 years the names will kind of change. The Celtic people will be called, you know, Britain. They'll be called English. You'll look at these different islands, whether it's Scotland or Ireland, and we're just speaking largely of the Celtic people. And this, you know, movement will be described as Celtic Christianity. See, again, he, he's trying to make a big deal about Celtic Christianity, but 
the, the unfortunate thing is we don't know that there are I don't know any primary sources from those early Celtic Christians or people talking about them beyond having seen a couple bishops. Like like all the stuff we know comes from later, which is unfortunate. But um, I don't think it's it's like he he and the, the the more important point is it's not like people like Henry the Eighth and Edward the Six uh, and Queen Elizabeth. Uh, it's like all right, we're broke from Rome. We're going back to the Celtic Church. No, they didn't do that. They took their theology not from the ancient Celts but from continental Protestantism. Uh, which is not a return to the ancient church. And whether or not the legend is true of Joseph of Arimathea specifically bringing the gospel to the islands, we know that Christianity took up residence in the Celtic lands because by the time the Council of Nicaea is brought together and that terrible tyrant, and I say that tongue-in-cheek, Constantine calls all the bishops from all the different lands Representatives are brought from the English area. Celtic Christianity bishops are sent from the islands to Nicaea as equal representatives. There is no, uh, no evidence that the Celtics believed in anything different than the rest of the church, though. And this is going to come up a bit later because there's going to be a controversy in the 7th century. I'm going to quote uh, some early sources on this to... 7th century uh, scholars and uh, or 8th century. No, it's it's a 7th century. And uh, yeah, so we'll continue. Now this is significant because it does not depend at this time on their recognition or establishment through Rome. They had been established in Britain. They were recognized as co-brother bishops and their voice was carried inside the assembly of bishops inside the Council of Nicaea. I don't know what, what point he's trying to make. That There were bishops in Celtic England and they went to the Council of Nicaea. Yeah. And like, is, is he trying to say that those bishops believed in the exact same as him? Uh, 39 articles, sola fide, the abolishment of monasticism. I will now, this data point is very important because it says that British Christianity or Celtic Christianity was completely recognized as valid and equal among all of the various churches there at the Council of Nicaea. And so it's not as though Rome had the final say or as Constantinople had the final say or the Patriarch of Jerusalem had the final say, but rather the bishops as a family of churches brought together and had a council. And so the idea of deliberation recognized the authority. Unfortunately, we don't have the acts of the Council of Nicaea. Um, so it's hard to draw as, as much uh, conclusions. Um, has Christian Wagner seen this video? This guy is really bad. He has no citations and nothing. He can use to prove what he was saying, but here's like, um, he's probably seen it. Yeah. I mean, it's a fairly popular video, but of what we might describe as a autocephalous or self-governing church of bishops in the Celtic lands. Can he prove that, that they were not in communion with the, well, again, he'll say they were in communion, but the, the Pope didn't have authority over them, but eventually there's going to be a Celtic versus Latin issue. And it says, well, they believe, that, well, the same thing, essentially. So I, I don't know. He, he kind of refutes everything he says. Let's. Uh... Now, this is also important because it really brings an affront to this idea of Roman Catholicism being the default position of Christians. Because there's nothing really about the Celtic Christians that's Roman in the sense of Roman or Latin. They use their own language. They had the how is this an argument? Their own liturgy. They had their own calendar. They had their own color. The calendar thing comes up later, by the way. There's their own customs. And yes, again, as I said earlier, Christianity is historically different in, uh, in Germany, in Rome, in Carthage, in, in Jerusalem, in wherever. 
but the faith has to be the same everywhere. Again, you, you know, in my city, there's a Chaldean Catholic church. It's, a, um, it, it's actually a, a, a Roman Catholic church that Chaldeans have a mass in the afternoon for the Iraqis in, uh, in Calgary. That was their idea of Celtic Christianity. What held them together as a worldwide body or universal Catholic Church was not their commitment to a single pope, but their commitment to a single creed. They held. I agree. It's about the faith. The faith is universal. Again, the pope is only one part of that. Ecclesiology is only one part of that. There's Christology, there's stuff. <laughs> that's true and yeah we don't know a lot about these celts and the bit we do know comes from centuries later unless there's more i i've not read i could be wrong i don't know everything but we don't know a lot about these people but yes yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like camelot but are 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 they honestly going to say that these people like were against m monasticism against the papacy against uh, like believed in stuff similar to the 39 articles. I mean, anyway, let's, uh, let's to a Nicene orthodoxy. They confessed the same creed that they, they had been invited to help create. Amen. And so from here in the fourth century, the legacy is that Joseph of Arimathea established an independent English church. Recognize what does it mean independent? He, yeah, th th there were English Christians. As, as autocephalous or self-governing. Can he prove that? Yes, yes, it was auto. See, th is this kind of like a modern term Orthodox people use? I mean, there's no evidence that there was a separation of churches like that, like what he's trying to create. With his own recognizable bishop. Because we don't know a lot about this early Celtic church. We know it existed, but from more. the very earliest days of the church. Now, if I were to say, what are the great missionary or evangelists or saints of the Celtic lands here in the early years of the church, we would be remiss to not mention men like St. Patrick. But in our day and age, no. St. Patrick is almost synonymous with Roman Catholicism. Right? Which nation is St. Patrick the patron of? But Ireland. And in our day and age, Ireland is a what kind of nation? It's a Roman Catholic nation. But this is the type of anachronism that we have to overcome to understand the English church before it was Roman. Roman again. Okay, no, St. Patrick and Palladius, as far as I know, were both sent by Pope Celestine to do their missionary work. It was under his auspices. And I think John can can confirm that, right? In the, they were sent by Pope Celestine. There's iconography of this. You see, because Patrick was of Celtic Christianity, there was no connection between Patrick and the Pope of Rome. In fact, Patrick was the descendant of these Celtic Christian bishops. And this island of England, or British Isle, that... He did missionary work on behalf of Pope Celestine. So that's not independent, what Father Steve is saying. He was a part of, was Christian enough that it educated him or catechized him in the patristic faith. And so the story goes that's that Patrick right. was kidnapped by pirates, made into a slave in Ireland, escapes back to England, and then hears the call of the Lord to go back and evangelize the Irish people. This is the idea that he is a Celtic or English missionary of this native English church evangelizing the Irish people. And so the canonization or the saintliness of St. Saint Patrick predates really any connection that chronicle I've got coming in the mail. It's not cheap, believe it or not. But uh, yeah, no, it's <laughs> I've read portions of that one. That's good. But today we're mainly going to focus. Well, I, I 
I guess we'll find out who we're quoting. It's the Pope of Rome. And in fact, if you look at how St. Patrick evangelizes, he calls them to a simple biblical faith and yet confesses the very doctrines of the Incarnation and the Trinity in a way that is distinctly Celtic. Well, what does distinctly Celtic mean? Like, of course, St. Patrick believes the same thing as Christians in Spain or Rome or 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 France or whatnot but like sure he expresses it in different ways I mean I don't I I, I don't, he he's trying to create confusion where no confusion exists by throwing in Celtic 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 and again I should say Cranmer Henry VIII it's not like they're like all right we got to go back to the Celtic church because you know great missionary of the English people to the Irish people, this is really the beachhead or the foundation of the English church. Moving beyond here, this kind of Roman Celtic world, we have the idea that the Celts there in Ireland, as they are converted by Patrick, develop themselves into communities of a few hundred at a time. And exactly. these communities exactly. began to flourish. So much that Patrick. great men and noblemen began accepting the gospel as the island itself was Christianized. The next great missionary that's worth remarking of here, as we go from the British island into the Irish island, is our friend Columba. Now, Columba now is a nobleman, and he's this Irish priest slash prince. And some people think that Columba's mission or his religious vocation is in response to his life as a prince, that he was a man of war. And so to avoid facing the penalties, both intellectually or spiritual or maybe even physically, he commits himself to a life of prayer. And Columba gathers up monastic men and they move forward with the idea of evangelizing the Celtic islands or the Amen. Celtic world. Job, and so the gospel moves from Patrick in England into the Irish lands through Columba and Columba and his it's men travel to Scotland and they there establish again this Celtic Christianity. And so by the 500s Celtic Christianity is firmly established in its traditions, in its hierarchy, in its sacraments. Faith identical to that of Christians in Rome. Here in the British Isles, completely independent of Roman Catholicism. Or no. Uh, again, the term Roman, I don't know why he throws the word r r Roman, but the idea that the Pope didn't have authority, especially when, as, as I point out, as John is pointing out, Pope Celestine basically commanded, uh, had authority, Germanus, Patrick, Palladius, all the key missionaries in there. Or even completely independent of the Roman bishop. Uh. But as is the case at this time, we see the European continent beginning to converse with the each other. The European continent begins to converse even with the islands here in the British lands. So much that there begun, begin, so much that there continues this idea of intermarrying kingdoms. And so we have here in the sixth century, going into the seventh century, with the advent of Gregory the Great as the Pope of Rome, just at the same time. There in the Celtic lands, we see the rise or the marriage of Ethelbert to Bertha. And this is important because this is the king and queen of Kent. And so while in Rome, you have the Bishop of Rome being Gregory the Great, the great Latin Pope, really the first of the idea of the papacy. The first idea of the papacy was Gregory the Great. Um like papacy with like authority over universal jurisdiction. Well, that is blatantly false. I can't go through all the evidence now because that's not what the talk's about. Go uh, watch my response to Dr. Gavin Ortland. Go watch the thing I did on Swan Sona's channel with Eric Ibarra, how we talked about Vatican I, the first m millennium. Yeah, so. And then here in the Celtic lands, you have Ethelbert, 
the king of Kent, and Bertha, the queen of Kent. And Kent's significant in English history because Kent is really the origin of Canterbury, or yes. where the Archbishop of Canterbury, or the titular head of the Anglican Communion today. But the problem with Bertha and Ethelbert is Bertha had come from the continent, and she had been raised in the kind of Latin Christianity, the Roman Christianity, and she had been married to a barbarous or a non-believing king, and that was Ethelbert. And so Bertha sends note to Gregory, send me some missionaries that we might convert my husband. Nice. So Gregory, who at this time is also a, trying to establish political allegiances throughout the European continent, takes advantage of this. Now it's also important to So is it kind of like a, a ploy or something? I mean, hey, you know, I can take it over politically by just send some of my missionaries there. I mean, is that what he's trying to say? I don't know. He'll have to clarify. No, that here at the 7th century, that uh, Gregory is having already conflicts with the patriarch of Constantinople, that the Eastern Church and the Western Church are already starting to fray and faction, to have conflict with the outside forces pressing in on them. I disagree. So Gregory takes one of his great monastic leaders, a man named Augustine, from a Roman monastery, gathers up some monks, and ships them up to this Celtic Christian region <laughs> there in Kent. And Augustine lands... But again, although the customs of the, the Roman missionaries and the, the Celtic Christians are different, their faith is the same, and he's going to admit this. In there the in the region of Kent, greets Ethelbert, and to Augustine's surprise, and really to everyone's surprise, Ethelbert hears Augustine preach. But more than that, Ethelbert of Kent decides to convert or give his life for Christ. And so Augustine, in arriving into the Celtic lands, establishes his conversion with the king of Kent. And so this is really significant in kind of the uh, Celtic spirituality, because as much as the European continent describes the Celtic people as being barbarous or warlike and whatnot, it is here in the conversion of Augustine, of Ethelbert, or even previously with the conversion of the Celtic people by St. Patrick, that the people are converted just merely by preaching. There's no death, there's no murder, there's no wars. Yeah, they come in, they share the gospel, and the war. people of the Celtic islands are converted. I think this says something special about the charism of the church in the English people. But, as you might imagine now, there are, throughout the British Isles, a Celtic brand of Christianity, and now with the intrusion of Gregory's people now. and Augustine there at Kent, a Roman Christianity. And they are really living these two streams side by side. Yep, and are. as Augustine and his now emboldened missionaries begin to spread out from Kent, they get as far as north as Yorkshire, and they begin discovering what St. Patrick had left them. They begin discovering that the people here in the British Isles already had Christianity. In fact, they begin rediscovering that the Christianity that was here with the monastics and the bishops claimed the monastics. So, I mean, if you want to claim that the Anglican Church was r restoring that, one of the first things the Anglicans did was abolish the 800 or so monasteries. I don't know how many there were. It was several hundred monasteries in England. So, I mean, that just shows I, I, that they believe very, things very different than what the, um, uh, uh, what the, the Church of Cranmer believed and Cromwell and, and Henry and Edward. And, and, and keep in mind, the Catholic Church is, we have always had monks and nuns. So. To be the same church that they are. They claim. Yeah, they are the same church. Yeah, just different. Customs, same belief. To say the same creeds. They claim yeah. to say the same confession Amen. that Jesus Christ is fully God, fully man. Amen. And they even have this same, same common heritage through the Council of Nicaea. And so they, the missionaries the in Augustine universe. recognize that here, that Celtic Christianity has its own identity. And this is really great. And there's no conflict until... We see another... See, they have the same faith. 
And he just admitted that Pope Gregory, I know you, I know it goes away earlier than that, is the establishment of the papacy. And his missionaries presumably believed what he did, and they have the same faith as the Celtic Christians. So he's kind of refuted himself there. Now, they do have a disagreement, but not faith on a practical issue. And the word, and this is where it gets interesting. King and queen situation. Uh, <clears throat> in the 630s, there's a, a northern prince named Oswald who uh, begins to commune with the Celtic monks. And Oswald passes his kingdom down to his son, uh, Oswy. And Oswy ends up marrying a princess of this Roman heritage. And so you see, king is Celtic Christian, queen is Roman Christian. And it comes to a head at the celebration of Easter, whereas the Celtic dating for Easter was a week separated from the Roman dating of Easter. Very similar to what we have today with the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. But it was a problem because in his own household, Oswy had his Easter while his wife was still fasting. And so this caused, as you might imagine, consternation in the household. And so Oswy, this king, gathers together the Roman uh, leaders and the Celtic leaders and asks them to sort it out. Who is right? And the Roman missionaries say this very same thing that we described as triumphalism, that the keys... Triumphalism. There it is of the kingdom have been given to St. Peter, and therefore you should side with the Pope of Rome. Now the... That, that's, yeah, that's, that's classical papal authority. Celtic missionaries didn't necessarily disagree with that. They didn't disagree right. with the idea that Rome had a valid apostolic success. success. <laughs> okay, yes, they did, but it's more than that. It was the authority. And we are going to read two... I don't know if they're primary, but contemporary sources of the event. One is Edias Stephanus, the life of Wilfred. He's also known as Stephen of Repon. And the other one we're going to quote is Venerable Bede. And so the Celtics, knowing that they had plenty of people to convert, allow Oswy and his family to go into this Roman understanding of the faith. But at the same time, existed side by side. Here at this council would be English Celtic spirituality alongside Roman uh, spirituality. All right, let's uh, find out how they settled the date of Easter in 663. We're going to quote Stephen of Ripon's The Life of Wilfred. Then we're going to quote Venerable Bede. This is chapter 10. I'm going to read the whole chapter. Don't worry, it's under two pages total. On a certain occasion, while Coleman was Bishop of York, and Metropolitan Archbishop during the reign of Oswy and Alfred, abbots, priests, and clerics of every rank gathered at Whitby Abbey in the presence of the Most Holy Abbess Hilda, the two kings, and bishops Coleman and Agilbert, to discuss the proper time for celebrating Easter, whether the practice of the British, Scots, and the northern province of keeping it on the Sunday between the 14th and 22nd day of the moon was correct or whether they ought to give way to the Roman plan for fixing it for the Sunday between the 15th and 21st days of the moon. Bishop Coleman, as was proper, was given the first chance to state his case. He spoke with complete confidence as follows, quote, our fathers and theirs before them, clearly inspired by the Holy Spirit, as was Columba, stipulated that Easter Sunday should be celebrated on the 14th day of the moon if that day were a Sunday, following the example of St. John the Evangelist, uh, who leaned on the, the Lord's breast at supper, close quote, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He celebrated Easter on the 14th day of the moon, as did his disciples, and Polycarp and his disciples, and as we do on their authority. So they're claiming that their tradition goes back to the beginning. I continue. Out of respect to our fathers, we dare not change, nor do we have the least desire to do so. 
I have spoken for our party. Now let us hear your side of the question, close quote. So he's saying, look, we've always done this. We inherited this. It goes back to the earliest days. Um, all right. Egobert, the foreign prelate, so it's the foreigner, and his priest, Agatho. I wonder if this is the Agatho that eventually became Pope. I don't think so, but it may be, because keep in mind, this is in the 660s. Uh, he, he becomes Pope and uh, about 20 years later. Okay, where were we? Um, and and Agatho bed St. W- w- Wilfred, priest and abbot, use his w- w- wedding eloquence to express in his own words the case of the Roman Church and Apostolic See. His speech was, as usual, humble. Quote, this question has already been admirably treated by a gathering of our most holy and learned fathers, 318 strong at Nicaea, a city in Bithynia. Among other things, they decided upon a lunar cycle recurring every 19 years. This cycle gives no room for celebrating Easter on the 14th day of the moon. This is a rule followed by the apostolic see and by nearly the whole world. At the end of the decrees of the fathers of Nicaea come these words, quote, let him who condemns any one of these decrees be anathema, close quote. At the end of Wilfred's speech, Oswe asked them with a smile on his face, quote, tell me which is greater in the kingdom of heaven, Columba or the apostle Peter, close quote. Then the whole synod with one voice and one accord cried, quote, the Lord himself settled this question when he declared, quote, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Close quote. To this the king added, showing his wisdom, quote, He is the keeper of the door and the keys, I will neither enter into strife and controversy with him, nor will I condone any who do. As long as I live, I shall abide by his every decision. Bishop Coleman was told that if, out of respect for his own country's customs, he should reject the Roman tonsure and method of calculating Easter, he was to resign his seat in favor of another and better candidate. This he did. So, it's obvious that, oh, they've always done something. Petrian authority, based on that that verse in Matthew 16, this is how the Petrian see does it, the Roman see, the apostolic see, as they had said. And they're going to go with that. Now, I'm going to recount the same episode as told by Venerable Bede. Now, I'm not going to quote the whole chapter because his whole chapter is 10 pages, but this is book three. Uh, chapter 25 of his history of the English, uh, uh, ecclesiastical history of the English people. Okay. I don't know where to, okay. Uh, I'm going to quote about a page. So I do not deny that they are true servants of God and dear to him. And they loved him, uh, capital H I am referring to Christ in primitive simplicity, but in devout sincerity, nor do I think that their ways of keeping Easter were seriously harmful so long as no one came to show them a more perfect way to follow. Indeed, I feel certain that if any Catholic reckoner had come to them, they would readily have accepted his guidance, as we know that they readily observe such of God's ordinances as they already knew. But you and your colleagues are most certainly guilty of sin if you reject the decrees of the apostolic see. Indeed, <clears throat> for the, I need some water here. <clears throat> All right. Uh, but you and your colleagues are most certainly guilty of sin if you reject the decrees of the apostolic see. Indeed, for the universal church, which are confirmed by holy writ. For although your fathers were holy men, do you imagine that they, a few men in a corner of a remote island, are to be preferred before the universal church of Christ throughout the world? And even if you're Columba, or may I say, ours also, if he was a servant of Christ, was a saint potent in miracles, can he take precedence before the most blessed prince 
of the apostles to whom our Lord said, quote, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Close quote. When w Wilfred had ended, the king asked, Is it true, Coleman, that these words were spoken to that Peter by our Lord? He answered, It is true, your majesty. Then the king said, can you show me that a similar authority was given to your Columba? No, replied Coleman. Quote, do you both agree, the king continued, that these words were indisputably addressed to Peter in the first place and that our Lord gave him the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Both answered, quote, we do, close quote. At this, the king concluded, then I tell you, Peter is guardian of the gates of heaven and I shall not contradict him. I shall obey his commands in everything to the best of my knowledge and ability. Otherwise, when I come to the gates of heaven, there may be no one to open them because he who holds the keys has turned away. When the king said this, all present, both high and low, signified their agreement and abandoning their imperfect customs, hastened to adopt those who they had learned to be better and that's the end uh, that's a bit different than uh the the 39 39 articles where it says the bishop of rome had no authority in the realm of england it was very different back then but um yeah so i hope that that's w what actually happened and these books are both easily available uh this is b the ecclesiastical history of the english people this is a book called the age of Bede. They're both about 20 bucks on, on Amazon. Uh, and this, The Age of Bede, the, the chronicle you want to read is The, the Life of w w Wilfred by Adia Stephanus, also known as Stephen of Ripon. So yeah, get these to get the full story, meaning they submitted to the papal authority. Now, uh, let's finish the video. And so the two traditions exist there in English, the Celtic spirit and also this Roman spirit. And you almost see a, a happy marriage from this point on of expressing these different functions. In fact, there are bishops uh, uh, ordained together or consecrated together to kind of merge together these two valid traditions. But over the years... As the continent, the European continent, becomes more triumphalistic, as the yeah. Pope of Rome claims I more and more authority, we see that come down to the various Roman expressions. So again, we're not uh, <laughs> we're not giving any names or examples or instances. We're just giving they're triumphing over the, being more triumphalistic over the years kind of that. much that by the year 700 we see theodore of tarsus really imposing roman order and discipline on the church well it got imposed earlier with um with uh, um the, the the thing i quoted with the date of easter it got imposed earlier yes yeah, stuff gets imposed later and the the authorities in England, both the religious and secular, were more than happy to comply. We see that the old Celtic way of really local communities, monastics under abbots, being formally organized into Roman dioceses, organizing them, passing canonical laws, and understanding now novelly that the Roman system should be put on top of the Celtic system rather than living side by side. Like now this is uh, a significant departure from the earlier Celtic Christianity even though essentially they believe the same thing. At this time in the church the theology of the two churches was largely the same. In fact the church at this time was only divided by its really ethnic or linguistic differences. But as the centuries go on, the consolidation of political power is pushed into the religious realm. So much that the Roman Pope begins to see himself as a new Roman Emperor. And here on the continent we see the rise of the political papal states. And so between here and Henry...
But that really has nothing to do with England. Henry VIII, between the introduction of the Roman Catholic identity into Celtic Christianity and Henry VIII, we have a great deal of drama. One that would take no. an entire no. course to go through, whether we talk about Henry's ancestors, the, the other kings of England, or we talk about how the Pope imposed his church laws into the system. We could because church and state are separate. Even the Magna Carta agrees with that. Talk about Thomas of Becket and the division of England. Do you actually want to defend Henry II in the whole Thomas Becket thing? Do you? Or King John? Or King John? Yes, there's a couple of ugly episodes with the church and politicians. But believe it or not, it was pretty good in England compared to like France and the Holy R Roman Empire. You don't have the equivalent of Canossa. No, uh, England was a devout Catholic country. In fact, I, I kind of often joke around that England should have stayed Catholic and France should have gone Protestant. <laughs> like, for example, I'm Canadian. I grew up in a, a binational state. You have, you have English Canada and French Canada. And French Canada is Catholic, at least nominally and historically, uh, and, and English Canada is Protestant. And growing up, I used to think the French were the super devout Catholics and the English were the traitors because they broke away. No, the English were far better Catholics than the French were. Constantly. It's not even a, a, a contest. Anyway. England of its loyalties. One set of loyalties to the Pope at Rome and one set of loyalties to the King of England. And what's the answer? You render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Church and state separate. And so rather than having a Celtic spirituality, we see with the introduction of the Roman rule. There's no, there's no Celtic spirituality in England from 1533 till 2022. None. That's, he, he's saying, oh, the, the Roman church snuffed off the Celtics, although he did say they believe in the same thing. The problem with that is um, the Celtics were, like one, he agreed that they were the same thing. And two, King Henry VIII is not like, all right, time to go back to the Celtic church. No. This bifurcation where England is two things at once and it is competing with itself between its allegiance to Rome and its allegiance with its own national history. No, this is largely a myth. There was the odd, ugly episode like Thomas Beckett or King John or... You, you got Henry II with Thomas Beckett and King John, and, and, and then eventually Henry VIII. But, like, the, those are the exceptions. He, he's, he talks like there was this eternal struggle for 500 years. And he, he's going to elaborate it more, but that's not true, that there was this 500-year struggle. Completely not true. Its own religious identity. And what's important to see in all of this is that the church before it was Roman was completely valid. It was completely Christian. It was completely orthodox. Yeah, and he said and yet it is through the, the intrusion of these political machinations, political. the Pope assigning who should be bishop, or the... Yeah, he, yeah and the, the, they always accepted that. I mean, should the King of England be appointing the bishops? That's why uh, th that's why Cranmer got to be Archbishop of Canterbury is because Henry VIII put him in there. I mean, do, do you want politicians appointing your bishops even if they are Anglicans? Pope picking who should be the ruling king or siding with. Um, I'm not sure. Ha has a pope ever picked the king? I don't think so. Occasionally, a king was excommunicated, but that was very rare. Um. And of course, that happened in all countries, not just England. I think King John. Um, but yeah, no, he's he's trying to create, he's trying to act like there was this 500-year conflict that just finally ended with Henry VIII. And that's really not true. This army or that army for who should be the successor the of the various the kingdoms there in the British Isle that begins all of this drama from the year 1000 to 1533. No, and so no, 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 there was not 500 years of constant struggle no there was a church and a state that lived side by side and by the way the 
bishops in the Church of England, the church in England prior to 1533, were all from Britain. It's not like they sent a bunch of Italians in Rome. Yeah, that was done in 600. But no, these were local natives. So this five centuries of tension between... Again, the tensions of myth. And I'm going to prove that. Um, the Pope in Rome and the kings of England is not so much the source of the Anglican Church, but rather the source of of the entire Protestant Reformation. Whether you look at Martin Luther or John Calvin or Thomas Cramner, it is the change and progressive development theology by the Roman Church that forces the Eastern Orthodox Church to break from them. It is the succession of... By the way, the, the Orthodox Church, who also claims to be the early church, does not agree that the Anglican Church is about church changes Sorry. and progressive developments within the roman catholic churches that forces all of these reformation again he's not giving any examples movements to pop up and say this is not how the church was delivered to us and so whether you look at luther or calvin or uh, <clears throat> thomas cramner you can see they are reacting against the changes began here with gregory and added over began with great what changes like uh, the protesting the date of easter because the kings fully accepted the 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 papal legates authority on that over the centuries both politically and religiously so that by the time we get to 1533 where the pope and the king of england are finally at their wits end it's it, he, he's not as yeah. though henry the eighth said i want to divorce or I want an annulment and the Pope didn't give it but rather it's the culmination of five centuries of arguing and fighting no, between the, it, it, the, there was no five centuries of arguing and fighting there's the odd ugly episode yeah if you want a, a single century of arguing and fighting take a look at 1533 the date where they eventually break from Rome and start their own church and the next hundred years after that, there you have fighting because the people knew their faith was getting changed. You got the pilgrimage of grace, the um, the by God re re rebellion, both in the late 1530s. Then in 1569, you got the rising of the north, huge re rebellion. Then you got um, in the early 1600s, you got Guy Fox. Now those last two. There was some politics involved, but they were doing that politics to try to restore the, the Catholic faith in England. That's when the true fighting happened, when they broke from Rome and, and started their own church. That's when the chaos and tension happens, not from 1000 to 1533. So it's literally the opposite of what Father Steve is saying. The church in England, this Celtic Christianity, and the church in Rome, which has been grabbing and taking authority and so well i mean the but again england had always submitted to their authority as i'd shown you in here and that was in 600 so 930 years before the break what's important again to close here is that the idea of the protestant reformation in england was a return to the undivided church well, no, because, I mean, the undivided church had uh, a ton of monasticism. Monasticism was huge. The first thing w what the new independent church did was abolish monasticism and took all their property. And they were un uh, the undivided church was under papal authority, as I have shown by the two primary sources. And, yeah, so, I mean, he's tr trying to say something there that was not. There was no idea that they were restoring some pure uh, Church of the Apostles. There was no idea that they were, again, continuing to be Roman Catholic. But rather, they had in their national memory the idea of the undivided church. The church of the seven ecumenical councils. The church of the first thousand years of Christianity. The church of St. Pat. Patrick, the church the of Celtic Christianity. Again, the reformers, the 39 articles, Henry, Edward, Elizabeth, were not returning to the Celtic church. They broke from Rome under Henry, 
now th- th- and he pretty much kept the theology intact save the pope but you get edward and El- El- elizabeth and w- where did they get their theology the ancient celtic church no the the stuff that was going on in the continent the th- theology of uh zwingli calvin and martin L- Luther, mainly Zwingli and Calvin. Martin Luther's theology didn't make into England much. It was those other two. But And so the call of the prayer book and the call of English Christianity is both at the same time. The prayer book. He, uh, he talks in an- another video how basically m- in England the uh, m- monastic tradition was replaced with the Book of Common Prayer. And uh, I'm going off old memory here and how like now we're all kind of a a monk in our own lives. Um, Okay, you you can say that you can even say that's an improvement, but that's not the theology of the undivided church, which had separate monastic communities. Again, monasticism is very important to the Catholic Church, to the Orthodox Church, to the Anglican Church. They essentially abolished it. Now, uh, there's some movements that are trying to bring some back, but I, I don't know how successful that is. A new church, the Church of England, is distinct and different from the church as it was under the Pope. But it also is a return to the church of their fathers, the church established even by Joseph of Arimathea. So as we talk about English Christianity... You know, he tries to make about three or four arguments and draw a single conclusion. He's trying to make a Protestant argument here, an Orthodox argument here, a kind of skeptical secular humanism argument here. And he's trying to draw kind of an Anglican conclusion to all of this. We have a great honor and legacy to preserve the faith of our fathers sent down to us for the last two millennia. And now go in peace. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost bless you and keep you this day and forever. Amen. Okay, so uh, that is, um, that's Father Steve's presentation. And Father Steve, uh, if you see this, you have an in, um, an invite to uh, to come on and discuss this. Um I'd be honored to have you on. You sound like a, a sincere person, a devout believer. Or if someone else wants to uh, try to defend, because there's a few Anglicans out there who believe what he believes. I know Father James, if you wanted to come on and defend this, or Jacob Watson, or Dominic, uh, Dominic, that guy who writes for Apologia Anglicana. So yeah, if if someone or someone else, the the invites open, would be interested in uh, defending these views, you know, just just send me, uh, just contact me on social media, and we'll set something up. I I think it was fair, and I, I tried to quote the, the sources as best I can, but um, yeah. So n- now I'll take a couple questions if someone has them. So, uh, yeah, just start throwing the questions in the chat. If there are no questions, I will kill the stream. And thanks for joining, John. That was nice having you always throwing out the sources. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's true. They were getting the pallium constantly. And then, of course, John Fisher got the um, the Cardinal's hat while he was in in um, in uh, the Tower of London. And um, King Henry said he'll have to wear it on his shoulders because he's not going to have a head soon enough. So, uh, King Henry the Eighth um, he executed a Cardinal of the Catholic Church. So, are there any questions, anyone? some water here oh yeah the two books that i recommended i'm going to go over them again uh, ecclesiastical history of the english people by venerable bead um it's 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 published by penguin it's easy to get it's cheap you can get this for like 20 bucks online even less 
And the second one is the age of bead. And I'm going to, uh, it, it's got some stuff by bead, but some stuff of beads contemporaries where he talks about, uh, it's got bead, the life of Cuthbert. It's got Dia Stephanus, also known as Stephen of Repon, the life of w Welfred, w which, um, I read from, uh, then it got bead, the lives of abbots of Wearmouth and Jaro, the anonymous history of Abbot Colfrith, and the voyage of St. Brendan. You can get that. You can get both of these on Amazon, very cheap and they're easy reads and enjoyable reads. You will learn a lot. If you're Catholic or Protestant or Eastern Orthodox, you will learn a lot from these books. So I suggest you put them up. It looks like there's no questions. So it looks like I will be killing the stream. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, sh like, share, subscribe. Uh, you can comment on this. Uh, if, if, um, if, you, if you know someone who you think can offer a response, send them my way. I'd be glad to dialogue with them. I, I'm trying to get more dialogues with people with opposing views on this channel. So yeah, now that um, you've got this video, go check it out. Let me know what you think. I'm going to kill the stream. God bless you all. Pray the rosary every day. It'll bring you closer to Christ and read this book, The Imitation of Christ. It's one of the greatest books ever written. You've got like the Bible, then you've got Imitation of Christ. Beautiful book. All right, I'm going to kill the stream. God bless.